crying out to you uh, in thanks and in hope and in gratefulness and in humility. We cry out to you asking for forgiveness, for direction. Some of us are crying out for peace or for healing. God, we all have something that we're holding on to this morning. Um, so I pray that whatever it is, that you, we remember that you are before us and behind us and that you are above us and below us, already preparing the way in your grace that goes before us. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can stand here freely and sing out to you this morning, God. Give us open hearts now, open ears, open minds to the word that you have delivered uh, to Pastor Joe to give to us today. May he speak boldly, with conviction, and with the Spirit. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So, um, I'm excited about today. Uh, some of you are excited because we're done with Psalm 119 today. But um, I do know this. I was talking to Megan about this on Monday. Some of you may not even realize it or not, but it's had a massive impact on you and how you view your relationship with the Word of God and how important it is. And it's such an emotional thing. Um, I've entitled the message today called, I've called it Coda. And so for a little help from a... a a talented, trained musician. Uh, we're gonna, Megan's going to teach us a little bit. Just Here's the definition of coda. The concluding passage of a piece or movement, typically forming an addition to the basic structure, specially intended to enforce an emotion of completeness, completeness and finality. So Megan, if you could just kind of explain and give a little demonstration or understanding. Uh, here was the coda we just sang. Remember love. Remember mercy, Christ before me, and Christ behind me. Your loving kindness has never failed me. Christ before me, and Christ behind me. The reason that is the coda is because that's what we, as the singers, are to remember. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ behind me. That is a coda. Isn't that awesome? So, this is a little, it's a little bit emotional for me because this sermon series <coughs> has caused a lot of turmoil in my own heart. As I look back at what my relationship with the Word of God was when I was journaling all this and studying it, not because I had to preach it, because I just wanted to learn. And we're concluding our series on Psalm 119 with song number 22 in this masterpiece album about the Word of God. And this last song, this last stanza, does actually musically have a distinctly different structure than the first 21 songs that we've preached on. Because this first, you know, throughout this uh, series, the first verse or two was sort of the theme, and then the rest of it kind of filled in the gaps. But this time it's very different. This time the first two verses are just repeated over and over again to the end. Maybe not in word, but in concept. It's a completely different structure, and the psalmist is extremely emotional. When he writes this, he has just concluded this amazing masterpiece. And the more I've studied Psalm 119 throughout these 22 weeks, the more I've studied it, the more awestruck I am at just what an amazing composer David is. The level of detail to structure and meaning and the careful placement of words and the repeating of words that are similar to the first word, but just slightly different is so profound. And you can tell because at the very end of the 22nd song, he gives this theme that is driven. It, the theme is driven home from what all the things he's sung about and written about and talked about in the first 21 songs. He says, there is no other place for me to end up than right here. This is the coda 
of my relationship with God's word. This is a structure meant to give us specific emotional feeling of finality. So let's read the passage, shall we? By the way, that's a, that's a coda symbol right there down in the bottom right-hand corner. And I've put it all throughout the slides. Just you keep this in mind. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. And then my lips will pour forth praise for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing aloud of your word for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you. Let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. The final enforcing feeling that the psalmist has concluded with is total reliance upon God. It's not his de d discipline in God's word. It's not his knowledge. It's not his ability to make sure he stays the path. None of that is the final coda of Psalm 119. One thing is, I am helpless. I need you every syllable, every letter, every line, every stanza, every verse, every song. I need you. And this coda of different structure enforces that concept. It's so different, I decided to dispense with the historical, theological, and devotional for today. Because it was so different, the way he wrote it, it's really only one definition, or one um, application. It's devotional. It's pure devotion. So we're going to talk about the four prayers of reliance that the psalmist emotionally prays in this song. The first one is a cry for understanding in verse 169. There's a couple of things he puts up there. Uh, you know, he uses the word uh, renaw, which means a shrill sound. A shout of joy and gladness or proclamation. Rejoicing. And then there's another word he uses. Bien. To separate mentally or discern. He's saying, I'm crying out to you for my plea. I want you to discern it and set it apart. He is begging for it. His desire is to see the world through the eyes of God. And notice that he starts with this. The most important request that he can make, and he's made it, what, only 4,000 times in the whole psalm? Crying for understanding? He says, this is the first reliance. I don't understand anything I'm reading. I read it. I can't grasp it. I can't comprehend it. God, please give me understanding. The psalmist recognized that everything else that he does is hinged upon God enlightening him with wisdom. The only way you can love God's word is if God supernaturally intervenes and enlightens you as you read it. You just reading it on your own benefits you nothing. You have to be visited by the spirit that wrote it as you read it. And he's saying, God, please enlighten me. Matter of fact, Paul prayed this for the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, 16 to 19. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. In other words, revealing the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. This is what he's praying for this church. I'm praying that your, the eyes of your hearts are enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? In other words, Paul is saying, I know that the only way you can really truly understand how great salvation is, is if he enlightens the eyes of your heart. So that's the first prayer of reliance. The second one in this psalm is a plea for deliverance. Verse 170 and 172. One word he uses is tekanah, a request for favor and grace. He's saying, give me grace, I need it. And there's another word, not saw, which means 
pluck me away, snatch me away. He says, I need grace and I need you to rip me out of where I am right now. I need you to pluck me from darkness. I need grace. I need mercy. I need you to reach down and grab hold of the scruff of my neck and pull me out. David recognizes that understanding God's word leads to a desire for deliverance from evil. Did you know unless God's word is in your heart, you don't see a reason to fall out of love with the world. But because he's given understanding, he recognizes, wow, I see the world through God's eyes. I don't want to be a part of what they're doing. Whoa, I need grace. Get me out of this mess. I couldn't see it before. You guys remember the poem I read by my friend Chad about the snakes and the, the paths of life? Remember we talked about that? When, di- when Chad wrote that, his eyes had been enlightened. And once that happens, you begin to plea and pray for deliverance. In fact, Jesus taught this is one of the ingredients of a good prayer. In Matthew 6, 13, he says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The result of God answering these prayers is an overflow of praise founded upon the words of life. That's why he says, please, Deliver me, pluck me out, give me grace. And what will happen naturally is my mouth will shoot forth praise. In the very first lesson of Psalm 119, we talked about the archery word, yada. It means to take aim at a specific thing, a specific reason, and give praise to God for it. It was an archery term with the idea of precision. He was saying, my praise isn't just because, oh, I feel good, I'm praising. No, I am praising specific things about God. This one is being plucked from evil. The idea of God's deliverance thrills David so much that the only response is a natural outpouring of thanks and praise. Then there's the third prayer of reliance. This is all part of the coda, a request for unceasing help. In verse 173, he says, keep your hand right next to me. Uphold me. Guide me along. Protect me from my own reproach. Remember that one we talked about in Psalm 119? It's one of the prayers on that prayer card I gave you. David realized that not only is salvation contingent upon God plucking us and enlightening us, but it's also contingent upon God keeping us. The only way that we can persevere as saints, the only way we can continue to walk with God is if his hand is on us the whole time. Because if God ever withdrew his hand from us, what would happen? See, this is the problem. A lot of people teach that you can lose your salvation. I can promise you, if you could, you will. Every one of you. Every moment of every day. The only thing that keeps you saved is God's hand. No reliance upon self. He's saying, my prayer of self-reliance is this, God... Keep your hand on me at all times. Even after you deliver me, I can't continue with your word unless you keep me with your hands. It's like when we have a child and we go to cross the street. What happens to your grip? It gets tighter because you know your child is prone to wander. He says, God, keep your hand tight on me as I prone to wander. And we talk about that in the last verse that we'll get to. Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39. Paul says this about God keeping his hands on us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Request for unceasing help. Please don't stop keeping me. Then there's the fourth prayer of reliance. It's longing for salvation. And what David does in this is the prayer turns to the eternal rather than the now. All these other prayers were, this is where I am, help me right now. Okay, you did this, now help me here. Okay, you did this, now help me here. And the last one is, I can't wait. 
Salvation is different from deliverance. And you ask that question at deep end, and I was already working on it, I promise you. Salvation, I, I didn't get it from you, so don't take credit. So, but salvation is different from deliverance. Deliverance is for now. And that's really fun, right? When we get delivered. I mean, that's really cool. That's some, emo that's some emotional stuff, isn't it? Deliverance from our own demons, from the evil of others, from the consequences of our own mistakes and sin. I mean, deliverance is really cool. Salvation, though, is for the eternal. He refers to his soul, not his body. His heart is on heaven, looking outward and upward. That's what this last plea is. He says, I long for your salvation. Just make sure you bring it to fruition. I am completely reliant upon you keeping your promise. I mean, totally, God. I'm, as I've just done 21 songs about how much I love God's word, I realize one thing. I'm still helpless without you. <laughs> These prayers are about total dependence. Total rejection of self-confidence, self-help, self-discipline, and trust in your own flesh or your own will. So here's the parting verse. The one that keeps ringing in my head over and over again all week. We like sheep going astray. <clears throat> I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. The psalmist, who clearly loves God's word, perhaps more than any of us in this room, how does he end? I constantly wander. I constantly stray. As much as I love God's word, I'm constantly looking to get away from it. <laughs> God, please, I go astray all the time. I'm asking you, even when I don't want to be found, seek your servant. Even when I close my bedroom door and turn the music way up, come in, turn it off, and put me back. The psalmist concludes this album with a confession that he is a straying sheep and asks God to seek him. Matter of fact, the scripture says no one seeks him. He seeks them. You know, there's a lot of churches, they call themselves, we're a seeker church. Well, that's silly because God's the seeker. <laughs> no one looks unless they're enlightened, right? The psalmist says that. God, give me understanding so I know I need to be delivered, and then I pray that you will deliver me. We must never forget our own propensity for sin, our need of mercy and grace from God. No matter how much you read God's word, how much you pray, how much you keep journals, you are still prone to wander. False spiritual pride begins to creep in and it pollutes your relationship that we have with God's word and his people. And just when we feel like we have arrived in our relationship with God, we must remember verse 176. I'm a sheep that likes to stray. God, come look for me. And David's conf confession that passion for God's word is supernatural and not by human effort is how he ends this. It's the Holy Spirit doing what we have called this series, the open heart surgery. It's the Holy Spirit infusing us with life and supernatural, that means not human, passion for truth. Now be honest. As I've gone through these 22 weeks about challenging you and prodding you and helping you understand if you don't love God's word, you probably don't have spiritual life and a bunch of other phrases. Haven't you been a little bit intimidated? Honestly, boy, I don't read the word very much. 
Have you been discouraged at times thinking, man, I am so far from where I need to be with God's word? Have you felt that way? Is it just me? Okay, let me just, I felt that way, do you? Okay, good. So now I I lowered the bar. Now you understand. (laughs) As I look back on my journal entries through this process, and and there's only one person really that sees my process of writing a sermon from beginning to end, because I put it on and I share, Megan sees it from the very beginning. I know you've looked at it and you saw, what is this crud? (laughs) I have, I just copy and paste all my journal entries from 20 years ago and I put them on the sheet and I start going through, no, I don't want to share that one. No, I don't want to share that one. Well, I can clean that one up. And then, and I go through and as I looked back on my journal, journal entries through this whole process, I have the same burden as you. I am so far from where I need to be. But you know what? I am confident David felt the very same way as he concluded this masterpiece. Because I can tell you right now, as your pastor, I can promise you this. There is great comfort in admitting you're prone to wander. See, once you get to the point where you say, oh, man, I am prone to wander. Boy, the pressure's off then. What are you saying? I cannot do this unless the great shepherd comes and finds me first. It connects you to the only true path to loving God's word. The relentless desire of God to go after his chosen sheep. Look at this verse. What do you think? This is Jesus, by the way. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the other 99 that never left. So is it not the will of my Father who is in heaven that not one of these little ones should perish? Do you see the themes throughout the Bible continue to repeat themselves from old to new? David says, I'm a sheep going astray. And Jesus says, doesn't the shepherd go after the one that's missing? That's what I'm doing. I'm more excited about the one that goes astray and is found than the ones that never left. A passionate relationship with God and his word starts the way David ended Psalm 119. You're not satisfied with where you are with God's word? It doesn't get better with resolve. It doesn't get better because you make a decision. It doesn't get better because you're getting good at religion. Being a lost sheep found by the great shepherd births passion for truth. If you haven't been found, the truth is kind of irrelevant to you. And today, I really wanted to conclude Psalm 119 with the Lord's table. Because the Lord's table is a reminder to us. It's a great coda of how great it is what God did for us. How the great shepherd left heaven to come get his wandering sheep the ones that didn't love truth. He came, he enlightened them, then he plucked them from danger, he helps them every step of the way, and then gives them eyes for eternity. Not only did he leave heaven, he came to earth to die for those wandering sheep. They were so lost and so hard to find, he said, the only way I'm going to get these sheep back is if I give my life for them. That's how bad I want these sheep back in my fold. He died for the wandering sheep so that we could fall in love with his word. Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, we all our sheep have gone astray. And God took our sin and laid it on Jesus so that we might be found. Church, today, as we conclude this 22-week seminar on how to love God's word, I'm giving you the final step. 
I'm inviting you into the comfort and confession of saying, I am a straying sheep desiring to be found by the Father. And as we celebrate in just a few minutes the great object lesson of the Lord's table, remember that little cracker that's on top of that little thing and the juice underneath it? It represents the body and blood of Christ, the great shepherd who gave his life to find us. Those are the costs of finding straying sheep like us. And my prayer today, through the emotion of this Psalm 119 coda and the symbolic lesson of the Lord's table, maybe some of you, for the first time, will be able to say, I have gone astray like a sheep. Seek your servant so I don't forget your commandments. So we're going to do the Lord's table a little differently than we have the last couple times. I'm not going to have you serve each other. I'm going to have you serve yourself. Because what I want to do is I want it to be a time of quiet reflection. I want it to be a time that you think of yourself as a lost sheep. And through the body and blood of Christ, God has come. He sought you. He's enlightening you. He's putting his hand beside you and he's pointing you toward eternity. So with that in mind, let me grab this table and bring it over a little closer. I will try not to spill anything. So in Matthew chapter 26, there's two verses that Jesus explains to his disciples what these symbols mean. If you have those little things, you can start opening it and get the, uh, just kick the piece of bread out first. As we do that, remain prayerful, remain quiet, and think of yourself, I'm a sheep, and I love to stray. Here's what Jesus said. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. By the way, it's interesting, he says, while they were eating. They weren't expecting this. He did it while they're eating. He says, oh, by the way, see this bread you're eating? He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. the body of Christ, broken for lost sheep. Then after that, he took a cup. And we had given thanks. <clears throat> he gave it to this, gave it to them. He said, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Church, why do we go through the hassle of 22 weeks straight? I'm just going to tell you, I don't know of any other way to teach the Bible. I can't do it topically. I have to do it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, line by line, because I am OCD and I don't want to leave and forget anything. My prayer is that the enlightenment that God has given you and the mercy he has given by plucking you out of evil and the way his hands stay next to you and points you to eternity gives you the same passion for truth that it has for me, your pastor, who is nothing more than a wandering sheep asking God to come find him. Heavenly Dad, we love to wander. 
There's so much comfort in admitting that to you. There's also more comfort in knowing that even when we don't want to be found, you find us anyway. You enlighten us, you pluck us out of evil, and then you become Christ before us, Christ behind us, guiding us to eternity. I love the fact that your servant David ends this masterpiece with, I am just a stupid wandering sheep. Please come find me. Total reliance on the work of Christ to bring us back in to the flock that loves you and your truth. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare to leave this place today, I want you to stand. We're going to sing our coda a couple more times as we leave, okay? Remember.